Test, test, test. So yeah, looks like I'm good. Okay. I'm Phil Wyman, and this is the Wild Theology Podcast, where the world, the humans in it, and God are all wilder than we've been told. That's your intro. So, you'll get philosophy and theology and crazy stories that come from 30 years of pastoring, 20 years of festival work, whatever, and the uh, mud and blood of wrestling with the living in the spaces angels fear to tread. Ooh, trying to sound interesting, are we? <laughs> oh. Yeah, you think you got something to say? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's the problem, Dimwit. Look, I'm a lot smarter than you think. Yeah, you tied your shoes this morning. Whatever. We're, We're Phil Wyman, Wyman, and this is Wild Theology, where you get to argue with your own ideas. And lose. That's the point. If you would like to support this podcast, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Phil Wyman. Hello, hello. This is an interruption in the um, Love Bigger Go Home series on Wild Theology podcast. And I am in Brownwood, Texas. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay, indeed. So, and, I, and I'm here, we're going to do a little kind of podcast discussion um, with um, David and Sandy Brown and Christopher Gaston, who live here in Brownwood, and um, they have some of the same questions about church life that uh, many people I know have. It seems to sometimes not be what we had dreamed it would be or hoped it would be, and and sometimes uh, there's the struggle of what do we do with Christianity in the age of Trump, and all our... Uh, Christian friends who are have trumped it up and we didn't follow that road. Um, as well as, the, it feels like there's a growing post-evangelicalism. So, um, here's Chris. Hello. <laughs> and David. Howdy. And Sandy. <laughs> Hi. And I'll let you, I'll just kind of throw out the question here. So church life and frustration with it. How and when did some of that happen? Um, I will say for me, I think that the church is a great place for people who don't know anything. Like they have zero background information. They they don't know what how the Bible was written. They don't know. They're just learning about the cross and they're learning about faith, and it's right. uh, very elementary in nature. Right. And for me, um, I would get bored in services hearing the same salvation message every Sunday, or hearing the same types of messages every Sunday. Just and there was not. It, it was very needful for people who didn't know anything. But right. once you move past the elementary stage and you've learned that, you've walked with God for a while, and you read the scripture and he shows you things and things like that, you don't see um, something deeper for right. deeper people who right. are at, at a different level. Right, right. Did you have something like specific you were looking for? Or... I, I can't say that I was specifically looking for something, but um, it just like you could only learn your ABCs a hundred times before you don't need to learn them anymore. Right, right. And, and that was really the thing with me is, that, you know, we were in that stage where we're learning, we're growing. And then it kind of moves into a season where we're serving. And so we're not actually even hearing the messages. We're not hearing what's going on. But we're helping with the children's church. We're helping with the youth. We're helping with the nursery. We're helping as greeters. We're helping to serve. Mm -hmm. And But even then now, there, you know, so there's a higher level of maturity in that. But there's not something that is feeding that level of maturity or stimulating or right. there's not... Uh, not even much conversation, you know, right. on just the the basics of right. Um, and the service probably didn't match the maturity, as it were, your skill sets and the service sometimes didn't match each other, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, David, you're in a little bit different situation. You're still running a number of things at church, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so where, where do you kind of stand in your feeling about these things? Oh, well, I, I really just in, enjoy uh, helping, you know, especially where there's a, a need in the local church community. And, right. You know, I'm happy to, to help where I can. That's kind of where I feel like I fit in, really. Right. Yeah, and the, and the serving. Right. Yeah. Right. Did you find any, uh, maybe some of the same frustrations like Chris was talking about? Oh, in in some ways, but... I guess maybe I'm still young enough. I'm still, <laughs> still. I don't mean young like years, but young in the <laughs> spirit enough that I still feel like I get, you know, fed just from. Right. Right. From yeah. Time. So you're in a little bit a different situation. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Okay. But. Uh, okay, yeah. Sandy. I'm with. So now I know you've got a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> about some of these things, and some of, some of them have to do with um, race issues. Um, uh, yeah. I have not. Uh, Sandy's I'm from or- Taiwan. Yes, I'm originally from Taiwan, and uh, live has lived in Texas in a very conservative t- uh, area of Texas for the last twenty three years, uh, and uh, encounter some racism. And uh, we were initial, I was, when I first came initially going to a evangelical kind of denomination church, a Baptist church, and there were quite a bit, I encountered quite a bit racism. There are people treating me, I was less, it's just mm-hmm. differently. Oh. And uh, um, said a few things, you know, uh, the people, they're just, their view just, tour me it was just different because of my nationality and then um, really found a home in a non-denominational church mm-hmm. for a while until the past election <laughs> and that was it was uh, I really really struggled with the fact how the the US evangelical circus rallied for electing Trump right. and uh, feel really marginalized by that. Um, right. I, I know I've seen people defending President Trump say he's not a racist, he's not, but I mean, I, I, I'm having, a, as a non-white person, I'm having a hard time believing that, just from his actions and his comments. All right. Yeah. So that's when I, after election, I just really, really struggle with continuing going to, through the motion of going to church. All right. And, uh, um, and knowing, and, and the listening to sermon talking about um, how God um, wailed for this election, and so that was coming from the pulpit. Yes, yeah, and a, a lot of I wouldn't say anti-gay, but just it wasn't um, not the message that we imagine Jesus would be preaching from the rooftop. Rooftop. Right. Right. Yeah. Just, just a conservative value, and I respect people have their own value. I just, but when it's mixed with given a political power that may right. me personally feel threatened. I did. I felt I felt unsafe oh, in okay. in America. Yeah. After the election. Right. Now did that same unsafeness travel to church? No. No, but okay. we're just having a I was having a hard time reconcile the fact that my friends would, I don't know what caused them to decide right. to vote for him, but they would, I don't know, I was just having a hard time. Yeah, now, have, have the three of you seen since when that election happened, 
Could you like put a number if you were asked to on the percentage of people from the church who voted for Trump? Oh, 99% probably. Wow, <laughs> really, really? Like, I haven't, okay. uh, I didn't, yeah, I, I would think the majority of them. And uh, our church has a Christian school, and mm -hmm. uh, my children sit, and I never heard this. I didn't hear this personally, but they said during Bible class, it was about, a lot of it was about how um, it was a Christian thing to do to vote for Trump to right. vote for the Republican right. candidate. Um, uh, I'm going to put a short stop on this for a okay. second. Okay, and so we're back. <laughs> with the, uh, Doing a little technical stuff there. Um, but yeah, we were on that question of the number of people and so you were talking about in the class. Mm -hmm. In the Christian school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so... <laughs> I know I didn't have to struggle with that quite as much in Massachusetts. The number of people who, who voted for Trump <laughs> is so low yeah. in Massachusetts to start with. The number of Republicans in Salem, Massachusetts mm -hmm. is a real low number percentage-wise. But then even among evangelicals, because of the greater culture around us was... Um, there's fewer evangelicals than there are in Texas, and there's fewer Republicans by far than there are in Texas. Even Republicans and evangelicals weren't necessarily voting for Trump in Massachusetts. So um, I didn't have to directly struggle with that tension of what it was to be an evangelical Christian who thought that Trump didn't look like the kind of leader I thought was a godly leader, um, what it was to be an evangelical Christian in the age of Trump. Um, but I, I think the main, the, what I hear over and over again, it's just, it's a one issue election. They only voted for Trump because they think that Trump will bring an end to abortion. Hmm. And so they'll vote for anyone Right. Who says they're against abortion, whether they have had 1,200 affairs or, you know, whatever they've done personally, if they say that they are against abortion, then that's who gets the vote. And that's the hot topic. That's the, the big issue is to put in judges who will overturn Roe versus Wade and... Um, and I voted for Bush twice on that note, and uh, that it didn't happen. So I'm right. personally, I thought, well, you fooled me once, <laughs> shame on you. Have fooled me twice, was well, shame on me. I, I don't see how the abortion issue, if it, if really a Republican president will end it, it would have ended mm. a long time ago, and uh, I mean, I. It's a social, moral issue. It's multifaceted. I mean, I, I think it was just, it's, it's a trap to dupe people from thinking, we want your vote and this is our platform. Right. Yeah. You care about this, so we care about this too. It yeah. feels a little bit yeah, like yeah. a yeah, uh -huh. bait yeah. and switch thing yeah. going on in politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How, um, so now, you you are at church more often. Yeah. Obviously, um, how does that political stuff play out for you when you're there? Especially as you know, taking this kind of a as the husband of the non-white offended party, as it were, right? Um, who's who's felt the tension of these things? How does that how does that play out for you? Well, I guess you know my personality is more of a is more of a pacifist, so I just I kind of just don't get involved really. I just sit there quietly, smile. Um, I'd say probably at work I, I say a little more when people are just really you know, really, uh, oh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
when they're when they're saying stuff that doesn't that's just not true. It's not correct, and right. their their theology and thoughts about Trump and everything is just really messed up. I'll say a little something, but um, for the most part, I just kind of yeah shake my head. <laughs> so. So in church setting, in the church setting, do you find yourself shaking your head as well? Yeah. Yeah. What makes you shake your head? His neck, yeah. Oh, those muscles the, right there. Muscles. Chris is pointing out the muscles. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, and just when people say that, you know, Trump is God's man for this country. Hmm. Yeah. And you're hearing a lot of that, or you have heard a lot of it? I've heard a lot of it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably not as much recently, but have. Yeah. There's a little little more beating that's coming down with Cohen on the stand. and it, would, it seems like it'd be harder and harder to say that, but it's not for everybody. I think it's ironic how many people see Trump as this Darius fellow or this serious, serious, yeah, the the um, you know who Cyrus. Cyrus, yeah, who led the children of Israel out of captivity, yeah. and um, they think, oh yeah, God appointed him, and but by their same logic you know if god was involved in the process then he was equally responsible for all of the other presidents who they were opposed to <laughs> you, you, you know okay god's in the process and he got trump elected but god was somewhere on vacation when obama got elected or when clinton <laughs> got but okay well either god's involved all the time or really it's more like the people were involved and god's kind of watching what the people are doing and um, first I thought God didn't care much for kings and second I, th- I didn't know we were voting for kings in America you know <laughs> <laughs> I mean I thought we passed that I thought that there was a revolution or something yeah. <laughs> a few hundred years back well we have voted for two Georges <laughs> well three <laughs> yeah. King George too <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, w- one of the things that I really find sad as well is, of course, the, the big issue is the abortion thing and that they're sold on. It, it's like they see Trump and the Republican Party and the Republican platform as this type of savior. They put their hope in this. Right. And not in God to bring transformation, not in God to change hearts or to change lives or to do anything. But it's in judges, it's in laws, it's in legislators, it's in um, the political process. Um, Interestingly, you know, and I understand that Rome was not a democratic government, but Jesus didn't speak against or try to change the governments or to try to change policy or to, uh, you know, he, he had very little involvement in it except, you know, he was put before Pilate and he was put before Herod and, and um, you know, was Herod, was he said, just, can you do a miracle? Can you sh- show us like one little magic trick? Or, you know, he didn't right. even really care. Um, but we have taken our focus off of who God is and what he can do is this transforming power of love. And, um, you know, Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house and he didn't say anything to Zacchaeus about stealing is wrong. You're going to go to hell because you're stealing. You're going to, you're going to burn forever. You're going to do all this stuff. He just said, let's go eat lunch. And Zacchaeus was so, he's like, you know, he, he wants to eat lunch with me. He, he, he was so blown away by that because he didn't carry that same voice of accusation. And, but the church, the, the whole thing that we've got, it's just accusation, 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 right. uh, condemnation. And it's just like, and then we put our hope in this man, this office, this president. We're gonna, if he can't do it, then our, our nation is destroyed. And that's of course goes back to that. They think that's why God raised him up 
um, to be right. this person, this uh, salvation figure or, or whoever. But Jesus is all those things. He did all those things and he's in us and we're in him and and he's the only savior that we need, only deliverer that we need. He's the one who brings transformation and, and change in the culture. And, uh, I think Sandy mentioned well, it's very, it's so multifaceted mm. and really on both sides uh, we're so polarized that we don't ever just stop to sit down and listen to the other side without saying anything. No response, no rebuttal, no, but just to hear their heart, to learn them, to know them, to meet them. Whether we agree with them, whether we condone it or do not condone it or whatever it is, right. but there's no listening. There's no communication. It's just, oh, you're for, well, then you can possibly be a good person, you know, or you're against it. Then, you know, you have no idea what women suffer through or. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, back to the, I guess, the original thing, it's just the, the balance between, to me, like, personally, not going to church doesn't mean that I have changed my faith in God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, I just, I have walked away. To me, I see it as I walk away from a form of something, but I haven't mm. walked away from my love for Jesus, my relationship with Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, um, and just balance that. Well, continue to pursue spiritual life, pursue knowing God. Right. Without a, a weekly attendance of a religious right, rite. right. And uh, that's just where I feel right. like that's where I am. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Like like we were talking about earlier, I see so much of that. There's a lot of post-evangelicalism that's kind of post becoming post-Christianity and I've I've seen a lot of people when I, in the numbers of people that I know who are have become frustrated with church mm-hmm. and then moved out of that particularly evangelicalism some moved into uh, more liberal traditions of Christianity and feel solid there others have I've watched their theology slowly degrade into something that's not Christian at all, and many of them will admit they're just not Christians anymore. Um, and I suppose there there is that question. So how do people can do like you guys if you've moved to a place where now church is not your primary location for the feeding of your faith? How are you keeping your faith alive? And and how have you experienced, I guess the first thing is, how have you experienced these frustrations and not become, have not thrown the baby out with bathwater? You know, I'd say, okay, well, Christianity is just a mess. I've tried it too many times, and that church and this, and this church is a mess. And oh my gosh, Christianity must then just be a mess, and the whole thing must not be true. How do you not do that? I mean, of course Christianity is a mess. People are, people are messy. We are messy creatures, and it took Jesus, the blood of Jesus to re- redeem us. And I think just just growing and being rooted in love that um, I came to God um, as a, from a Buddhist country and because I experienced this is my personal uh, spiritual journey was I was my parents were Buddhist I was surrounded by Buddhist and uh, a missionary gave me a, a track the gospel track and when I read the track that night in my room I felt the love of God and I knew something in in me knew God's real, that Jesus is real. What this mm-hmm. saying is the truth. So I received Jesus as my savior just by myself. And then and I will go around and tell people I was Christian. <laughs> I didn't own a Bible. <laughs> I didn't really know. I mean I, all the uh, God and Jesus I knew was from that little track. Mm-hmm. But I, I would tell people I, I'm Christian. I I'm um uh, I found God through Jesus. And I think it was a couple of years later, one my father's, um, my father was a high school teacher, one, another teacher at the school became a Christian and invited my father to church. That's how I ended up 
in church two years after my salvation. Right. So I have always known God is real, like in my heart, right. not a head knowledge. In my heart, I, mm. I know and that the love of God that found me. Mm. So I, I guess that's kind of, that's I like, rooted my journey in that. So you didn't need church to no. yeah. retain that. Mm -mm. That was retained throughout. Yeah. yeah. So that that's how always been my root, be, be yeah. my foundation yeah. in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Then I, will, I raise my children, hoping they find God and mm -hmm. in the real way. I did. I encountered Him. Yeah. Wow. So. And I think for me, um, even from a young age, I learned how to feed myself. I, I wasn't relying on someone else to feed me, like to go to church. Now I went to church and I listened to a lot of good messages. There was a lot of good insight, a lot of good wisdom. I learned a lot of things, but that wasn't my primary. Mm -hmm. Like I have always had quiet time. I've always had time in prayer, time in scriptures. I've uh, just had a. Uh, even now, I mean, there's just a pursuit of God, the things that God is showing me, and God is working in my life, and things that. I see that I'm chasing after, and um, you know, so it's always just been uh, very personal. That, and to some extent, this is what's frustrating is um, in the church uh, we teach uh, doctrines, mm -hmm. we teach theology, but we don't teach intimacy very well. And, uh, you know, so we've got all of this head knowledge about God, but we have very little actually hand in hand walking with Him in our daily journey. And um, so that is a little bit frustrating for me because, like, I see things like even, you know, now whoever the name pastor is, you know, they had a heart to pursue God. They pursued God. They got incredible revelation, incredible breakthrough. And then what they do is they build colleges and campuses and all these to teach the revelation, but not the heart yeah. to pursue God. Yeah. And I think that that's really what's sad is that people, the followers, they try to emulate the personalities of these people, you know. And so we have these little clones, but what they didn't clone was their heart posture to know God and to seek God. Mm -hmm. And so we're not seeing the same fruit of it. It's just kind of... You know, they came, and then it's kind of bloomed, and, you know, it's kind of wilted, and then the next one will come, and uh, people will come and look at the flower, but they're not. Um, they're not flowering themselves. Right. Sounds a little bit like uh, <laughs> at the end of one of the, those, remember the silly Ernest movies? Ernest went to camp. Yeah. So, so at the end of it, he takes, uh, it was, was it Napoleon's quote of, I came, I saw, I conquered. Or was that? Maybe Alexander. That Alexander the Great, yeah. So, so, so something happens where he gets blown up. And he goes, I came, I saw, I got blown up. <laughs> well, that, was, that would describe a lot of people's church experience. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Um, yeah. So, no, I suppose it's a little bit different. The, the question of retaining... A vibrancy of faith since you're at church more often some people would be asking the question how do you retain your vibrancy of faith and go to church <laughs> I mean there are, there are people literally I, I have friends asking that kind of question I can't keep my faith while I'm still going to church um, how do you do that um well, I guess I kind of refer to the saying that I find myself kind of adhering to. You chew the meat and spit out the bone. Mm. So you know when you hear something good, oh yeah, that that's uh, you know that really uh, jives with my spirit. You know the spirit of the, the Holy Spirit saying yes, that's good, that's good stuff. Right. You want to hear stuff that's not good, not right. It's not God. <laughs> Okay, well, just disregard that. Let's keep going. Right, right. You get a circular file for that one. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Spit that one out. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, one thing I'll say of the church, I have no disrespect for anyone who's in the church. Like, I, e- even today, I see people from our church that come by our little cafe every day, mm-hmm. nearly. And I'm always so glad to see them. And they're, you know, they're sincere and they love God. And I love them. And I know that they love me. And, uh, you know, so I have this great respect for them. You know, the pastors that I've sat under... I just, they're incredible people. I know I could go to them for anything that they love us and uh, the people love us. And so there's, so, and that's part, that, there's a, a stretch right, in that right. as well, basically, because how do you, uh, how do you, how do you be in this community where there are people who love you and people that you love and, um, but you're not growing or learning or doing anything. So how do you balance that with, and, mm. and for me, so I still see these people around town all the time. Um, every time I see them, you know, I give them a big hug. You know, I'm always asking how their family is doing, how their kids are doing at school, and you know. And so, um, but it's not so much in this setting of going to a building, right. sitting for an hour and listening to someone talk to you. Right. And right. then we visit with them for a few minutes before or after. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I like that a lot. I find myself often in this tension where I can be one moment one of the biggest defenders of Pentecostal and charismatic and evangelical Christianity because of so much good that it's done in the world. You know, particularly it's the hottest thing in the 20th century for you know, the kingdom of God. It, it was just, it was ripping it up everywhere and doing amazing things. On the other hand, it's done some terrible things and I, and I can't and won't defend those. So sometimes people are looking at me sideways like, excuse me, you got burned how badly by the church and you're defending it now? But I feel much like you do. It's, um, and, and, and for me at least, it, it's one of the things I wish I could see in politics in in both parties, and I want to see in churches something that is self-correcting. The people inside it who love it are the ones, they're instead of attacking something outside Mm -hmm. that is accusing them of doing something bad, they go, yeah, you're right, we messed up, didn't we? And then they -hmm. they start critiquing from within. But typically what happens is, you know, I was born on Martin Luther's birthday. <laughs> and, and what happened to him is yeah. kind of what happens to those who critique the church from the yeah. inside. He didn't want to start the Lutheran church. Mm-hmm. You know? He so, wanted to. Yeah. Yes. He wanted to reform. <laughs> right? Yes. And John Wesley wasn't trying yeah. to leave the Anglican church. Mm-hmm. He didn't start the Methodist church. Mm-hmm. Um, but that tends to be what happens. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you become a, a critic... In a positive way, you're critiquing and, and hoping to change. Then you're looked at as an as one of the enemies, um, and yeah. <laughs> so that did you ever feel like you're caught in the middle of that? Like I love Jesus and His Church, but here's this, and when I speak to it, I find myself in trouble. Um, as to that um, I just like during the political season and the election and now the recent uh, you know midterm election with the senators and things I just didn't say a whole lot I when I do it's very brief and just to maybe give an alternate perspective and so not to try to say you're wrong or you're wrong, right, right, or, right. but to say, or, or maybe this is a possibility. But uh, aside from that, I really didn't get into um, the discussions that are going to, you know, push people's buttons. All right. right. And... Um, oh, I never do that. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and, and so, and especially okay. on social media where, you know, we can sit down here and I can see your expression. We can enjoy a meal together. We, 
But there, it's so impersonal, and it's so easy to stand behind this wall that nobody sees you, nobody knows you, nobody, you can right. say whatever. And a lot of people say a lot of things that are very hurtful. And I see that time and time again from the church. Oh, Lots yeah. of people in the church, and they're bashing uh, this group or that group, or yeah. you know, or we're we until uh, every homeless veteran is housed. You know, we're not going to give any money to illegal immigrants, right? But you're not doing anything to f house the veterans right now. So why is that even an issue? You, you're not doing anything to be part right. of that, but somehow you're saying that the other is wrong because. The other, you know, and, and so, and there's just a lot of hurtful things that come out on social media. And, and by and large, um, I think several years back, um, I know I was unkind and I said some things mm. that I should not have said. And I, I have tried to really restrain myself and tone it down. And, you know, a lot of times I'll, you know, read, write this long rebuttal and then I'll reread it three or four, ten times, and then erase it and not post and go on. <laughs> and I have to do that that's, a whole lot because it's good restraint. <laughs> it it uh, sometimes you just look, just just bite your tongue and just, <laughs> and that's really hard. And part of that is just it has to do with culture and regionality and upbringing and maturity right. and um, and so. It's, you know, it didn't seem to be a difficult thing for Jesus to just love all kinds of people in whatever region or maturity or culture or whatever they were in, except that he got most frustrated with hard hearts in religious contexts. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I remember looking a number of years ago, whenever Jesus was talking about hell, he was talking to religious people. <laughs> I thought, oh, we've been using this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> we're not as rough as Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It, we're not. We're rough to the outsider. Instead of our And not <laughs> to ourselves. Mm -hmm. you know, in a sense, Jesus was doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. He was rough to the insider and mm -hmm. gracious to the outsider. Which I think is part of that self-correcting thing. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you. So this is Chris. Hello again. <laughs> and David. Yep. And Sandy. Hi. And this is Boreas. He's <laughs> trying to lick my face right now. He's so cute. And we're out. This is a Wild Theology Podcast. Thanks. Thank you to my patrons who help make these missional travels and these podcasts possible. Without you, I couldn't do it. God bless you. If you'd like to support this project, you can do so here on Patreon for as little as $1 a release. And at the most, that's $4 a month. Why on earth would anybody want to support us? Well, I think we're pretty cool, and maybe some people believe in what we're doing. Oh, come on, you really believe that? Hmm, yeah. Don't you ever think you're just a little too weird for the average person? Um, yeah, sometimes. <laughs>